I won't read too long, I'll read for four hours. <laughs> I won't read too long, I'll read for 30 to 40 minutes. Um, all right? I won't keep you there too long. Um, I'm going to start with... Um, oh, bloody hell. <coughs> I lost my uh, list of what I was going to read, and I just found the old list after making a new list. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Now that's going to confuse me. <coughs> so, uh, I'm just going to move around a little bit from the different individual collections. Um, and the first one I'm going to read uh, is one to my son, uh, The Alien, page 93. Sorry. <laughs> page 93, why am I telling you that? <laughs> um, maybe it's the, uh, maybe I just had a drink of the, um, the IP, double IPA. Yes. <laughs> I warned you. <laughs> well, well, actually I have, I used to have one every day, so it's not, I normally have four or five, just joking. <laughs> just being a stereotype. <laughs> this is to a child in, um, uh, who's 18 you now and he's going to college this year. Um, in a, looking at the ultrasound, you know, um, every, all the words are real and so forth. Um, the alien. I'm back again, scrutinizing the Milky Way of your ultrasound, scanning the dark matter, the nothingness that now the heads say is chock-a-block with quarks and squarks, gravitons and gravitini, photons and fortinos, or sprout, who art there inside the spacecraft of your ma, the time capsule of this printout, hurling and whirling towards us. It's all daft on this earth, or alien who art in the heavens, or Martian, or little green man. Uh, we're anxious to make contact, to ask divers questions about the heavendom you hail from, to discuss the whole shebang of the beginning and end, the pre-Big Bang on time, before you forget the why and lie of thy first place. And, our friend, to say welcome, uh, that we mean no harm, we'd die f for you even. That we pray you're not here uh, to subdue us, that we'd put away our ray guns, missiles, attitude, and share our world with you, little big head, if only you stay. I think I got the little big head. Do you remember? You won't remember, darling. Um, in fact, Zangita won't remember either. But you remember there was a movie called Little Big Man? Yeah. 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 I mean, you say it as if everybody would remember it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Crikey. I say it to my students, huh? <laughs> and they say names to me then, and I, I say, huh? And they get really insulted if I don't know the names. Um. I'm going to say a poem by Patrick Kavanagh, partly because Gail is here, the, the marvellous artist in, of the exhibit outside, um, and I'm going to try and tie in a few poems into that, um, into the, the show, the exhibition or whatever, the paintings. Um, Kavanagh's poem, uh, he was a farmer, he was probably, in many ways, I mean, Yeats is the greater poet if we have to talk about those things in the sense that he had a larger um, range of types of poems and what he did and the magic that Yeats could access in the ineffable of what an artist does, that he, he was larger, that probably he was larger than Kavanagh, except it is completely wrong to compare poets. Uh, if they're great, like he was great too, you know, just a different type of 
Oxford, but he, he was bigger in Ireland because he articulated uh, for the Irish people the state of being on farms uh, and so forth, you know. Um, if you have Irish backgrounds and if your parents left, or grandparents or great-grandparents or whatever, they would have understood Kavanagh more than they would have understood Yeats. He spoke from that world, do you understand? He understood uh, the kind of sensibility of uh, Irish people in a bigger way than Yeats. Yeats. Yeats kind of created a kind of a myth, really, around... Whereas Kavanagh kind of got at the, the root of things, you know what I mean? There's nobody saying anybody's better, if you don't mind me. Do you understand me? Um, but anyway, Kavanagh grew up on a farm, and he, you know, they were very poor. Um, but this poem is um, one of the poems that break from the literal into the metaphorical, which later other poets would pick up on, like Seamus Heaney in the, to in, in the bog poems and so forth. Um, He broke, <laughs> I don't mean the pun like it, but he broke ground in many ways uh, ahead of the game. You know, he talked about his parents, the father it was just really, in a way that mm, nobody, not even Frost did. Um, Frost was different. I mean, Frost is just a great poet, like, but anyway, this is the poem. To the man after the harrow, you know, the horse. Now leave the check rain slack. The seed is flying far today. The seeds like stars against the black eternity of April clay. The seeds as potent as the seed of knowledge in the Hebrew book. So drive your father. So drive your horses in the creed of God the Father as it stuck. Forget the men on Brady's hill, forget what Brady's boy may say. For destiny will not fulfil unless you let the harrow play. Forget the worm's opinion too of hooves and pointed harrow pins. For you are driving your horses through the mist where Genesis begins. Gorgeous. A dangerous poem to read. You always should never read great poets when you're reading your own poems. You can really kind of fall off the... I mean, now you can shoot... I mean, somebody could shoot me now, like. Uh, Leave-taking, a poem, a very early poem, written when my father died of a sequence in 1986. Well, oh, no, earlier. Earlier, crikey. Um, but the, the, the you, of course, is me in it. But, you know, we, he used to always bring me to the train or the bus always early. I'm always late, anyway. And he'd bring me early. He'd wait, he'd wait outside the window. You'll get the poem. You know, he'd embarrass you. You know, when you're, you're embarrassed. Get, my son is 18 now. He dreads me like sticking around when his buddies are around. I'll embarrass him just by being existing. You know what I mean? <laughs> what you got? Um, but anyway, leave taking. After you board the train, you sit and wait to begin your first real journey alone. You read to avoid the window's awkwardness, knowing he's anxious to catch your eye, loitering out in never-ending rain to wave a bit shy. Another final goodbye. You were afraid of having to wave too soon. And for a moment, you think it's the train next to you has begun, but it is yours and your face pressed to the window pane is distorted and numbed by the icy glass, pinning your eyes upon your father as he cranes to defy the disappearing train, both of you waving eternally to each other. <laughs> All is humour, isn't it? That's all we've got left in this world. <laughs> Actually, I should read a funny poem. I'm breaking my list. Do any of you have problems with your socks? Men usually do. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> me too, like. <laughs> but in the winter, we have to wear them, right? I know. Uh, uh, but 
I don't know about the women. I'm not going near the women. I don't know. <laughs> we, have, we have problems too because when you wash the socks, yeah, you yeah. wash two socks and one comes out. <laughs> yeah, they just disappear. I, I have a whole drawer of I bags full of single socks, <laughs> and it's just a mystery. <laughs> Do you not find some of you find that? Yes. It, 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 it's one of the mysteries of life where those socks go. So I got a poem over it anyway. The lead up is probably better than the poem. The sock mystery. It's about 20 lines. There should be an asylum for single socks. Lost, dejected, turned in on themselves. The twin sock, soulmate, doppelganger, gone AWOL. On the lamb, slipping through a time-space warp somewhere within the module of the washing machine. Our dryer rattling in the cellar's deep space. The one never to be found again. Gone. We know not where. To the afterlife of socks. Sock Tartarus, the Elysium of Argyle. The heaven of crew, gold toe, tennis, winter woolly, summer wear. Surely there's no purgatory or hell for socks. <laughs> Even for absconders who walk out on partners, family, before their souls are worn threadbare, their number up. The odd time it happens, these socks get lonely for the earth. And weeks, months later, the prodigals meekly reappear under a bed, a cushion, <laughs> wardrobe, only to discover that their partners have disappeared, passed on, unable to make it alone. But how good it is to see socks united once more, tucked into each other, close, touching, at one the deserter promising to stay put, not to take a hike, not to do a runner at this time. No greater joy is known than on these occasions. Such dancing, such cavorting, such jubilation in the kingdom of socks. <laughs> I loved that poem. I said, I sent that poem everywhere and nobody took it. Sent it to New York or that, that, like one in the all like they usually take something. And I, this one no one took. I sent it down to the smallest magazines. Nobody took it was like the sock itself. <laughs> it was a last sock poem. But I said I suck a tube. <laughs> Sorry, I mean that's terrible. These are uh, I've never said these things before, actually. Not, like normally if I just have said the same things, but this drink is still great. Thanks for having me. I was going to read a funnier one, but no, loose drive. You know, the, the plant that's killing all the other plants. This is, comes. It came from Europe originally, and we're not sure how it came. To, and all the reasons are given at the start. Some people, anyway. It finishes with us, but the previous poem is called U.S. So there's a tie in here, you know what I mean? It's a little sonnet. A little sonnet. Christ, how can you have a little sonnet? But it's an American sonnet. <laughs> Loose Strife. You have become your name. Loose Strife. Carried on sheep. Spurting up out of ballast. A cure brought across the deep to treat wounds, soothe trouble. There have been others like you, the rhododendron, the cattails that you in your turn overrun. Voices praise your magenta spread, your ability to propagate by seed, by stem, by root. And how you adjust to light, to soil, spreading your glory across the earth, even as you kill by both, by air, 
by land all before you, the hardy iris, the rare orchids, the spawning ground of fish. You'll overtake the earth and destroy even yourself. Ah, or loose strife, purple plague, beautiful us. Um, not to, to continue on that uh, depressing note. Um, I'm sorry, like poems are a pain in the ass, really. That's why nobody reason they're too serious. Or the poets take themselves too serious. I always take myself too serious. Okay. okay. One, six, nine. This is a poem, um, another environmental poem, I suppose. Well, the last one was two, but it was more. It was other things also. I try to make. I do. I try to do what in a different way. What frosted. I mean. All right. All right. All right. I got a big head. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, but he 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 hid what he was doing on the surface. What he, his poems were very accessible on the surface, but there was an awful lot of other stuff going on behind them that you you had to know and had to be you'd have to figure out. You know, a lot of people didn't. A lot of thought, people thought he was kind of a bucolic poet, like um, pastoral or poet. You know, even pound earlier on, and a lot of poets know for me try to see all the fancy stuff. It's like dazzle on, on the top, and then you can't get it. There's nothing else much underneath it. You know. Um, patient, there's not, but after saying all that, there's no dazzle. This is just plain out easy, <laughs> nothing hidden underneath it. <laughs> Jeez, these beers are fantastic. Maybe I get another one, huh? I'm in business. <laughs> Did I say you were going to be here for 30 minutes? 40. <laughs> it's great beer, isn't it? Ooh. We're in danger. I may be right about the four hours. <laughs> Patient. The snow, these are, this is a very short poem. The snow has melted clean off the mountain. It's winter still. Yet another indication that Gaia is in trouble. That things aren't sound. The rocky mountain top shines like the bald head of a woman after chemo who wills herself out of her hospital bed to take in the trees, the squirrels, the commotion around town, sip beer in a dive, smile at the child ogling her shiny head, wishing it didn't take all this dying to love life. Sorry, I better get funny again, huh? <laughs> Humor is the refuge of a desperate man. <laughs> this is a light poem, but a hopeful poem about the environment and really um, set in a, a restaurant on the uh, Otter Creek in Middlebury. Um, today at noon, oh, sorry, it's, it's called From Woody's Restaurant, which it's not anymore now. It's changed, it changed to Tully Marie's, and then it changed to something else. But if you, some of you have been, you've all been in Middlebury, right? Have you been in Middlebury, darling? <laughs> Are you bored? Are you bored? Sure, God help us. I, I used to threaten my son when he was your age. He's 19, 18. And we never punished him, himself and his mother, his, right? We never punished him. And we didn't time out or anything. But the only thing I used to say to him is that, love, if you don't do that, you're going to have to go to a poetry reading with me. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then when, when, when he didn't do it, I'd say, love, you're going to have to do it because you're going to have to go to a poetry reading where I'm reading. <laughs> And you're going to have to listen to it. And if he didn't do it again, love, I'd say to him, I'm going to have to go to, you're going to have to go to a poetry reading. I'm going to be reading. And it's going to be really crowded. And I'm going to point you out and say, this is a poem about you. 
Dalian. You're great, love. Aren't you great? Pick, pick up, maybe pick up the energy of the ineffable part of why we're here in the world. Magic. Do you understand me? And we're sorry for fucking up the world for you. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm no car. I'm off the grid and I cycle everywhere during the winter. So you can remember like some of us were trying for you. I, and I got arrested outside the White House with Bill McKibben. <laughs> I can't do From speaking of Bill McKibben, would it, would it, um, Middlebury, like, of course, he's up in Ripton. But anyway, this has nothing to do with Bill. Although it has, it's just about, it's kind of a, a gentle reminder of the possibilities of somehow we might turn things around. But this was written 20 years ago. Sorry, darling. <laughs> you must take care of your own happiness. You can. I have to do it myself. The only reason I'd be so good with the, the bike and uh, I, I cycle all year, even to school, in the, in the middle of a snowstorm. I won't give in to it. And I'm 61 on Friday. Uh, but I do it for myself. So I can enjoy my beer at night time <laughs> all the more. Completely selfish. So you remember you take care of yourself too when you get older and when things get really bad, love. All right? Will you remember? Today noon, a young, macho-friendly waiter and three diners, business types, two males, one female, are in a quandary about the name of the duck paddling Otter Creek, the duck being brown, uh, but too large to be a female mallard. They really want to know. And I am the human watcher behind the nook of my table, camouflaged by my stillness and nonchalant plumage. They really want to know. This sighting I recorded in the back of my field guide to people. <laughs> you know the way the field guides, like you'd always back up. I saw a crow today, you know what I mean? I saw business people worried about the natural world. You know? <laughs> <laughs> White out, you like this one? I mean, this is Vermont, the Vermont poem. About being in a snowstorm, you know? And um, I, I, I was just going to give the whole poem away, but I, I saw it, it's a short, light poem. Light in both senses. Do you understand? Um, I shouldn't be saying those things about my poems. There, I, 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 I made light of the poems, and I... <laughs> And I made it light, which is an awful thing to do to a poem, really. He's, that poem is going to visit me tonight. So what do you mean I'm a light poem <laughs> in my dreams? Whiteout. I was going to school in Burlington. To a meeting, another meeting. <laughs> more, more meeting. Whiteout. The day gets away from me. Nothing done, and it's lunchtime, rushing to a meeting, held up by whiteout traffic, the snow calling a halt to the daily life and death tedium, committees, bills, email, post. If we croaked today, what difference would it make? I give up, tell myself to wait till the traffic eases off, park, drop into a shop, watch the snow erase the world. It is good to throw your hat at it all, not to turn up, be nothing, no one, watch the snow fall, turn to a blank page. Gail's exhibition is all about Irish landscape and Irish ways of understanding the sacred and so forth, even though, or not understanding the sacred, I mean, I don't, do you understand me? 
Um, you understand me? Um, I think my nickname in college is Do You Understand Me? <laughs> um, Vermont Dashling was a, a, a poem written in the 18th century in Ireland um, where Ireland was a woman, but it was used as a, a political poem, whereas like the poem would be um, something like, um, Oh, my dark Rosaline, do not, do not, do not weep. Uh, the, the priest is on the ocean, the ships are on the ocean deep, they're coming from Spain. With, and they were, they were all a way of telling, because uh, it was illegal, of course, to be political. And to be, they were, it was, um, 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 what's the word? Um, code for saying that there was going to be a resurrection to the people. And so, uh, do you understand me? And there were different, like Kathleen e. Houlihan would be one, would be one specific name. But there were other names, um, and I suppose you pro you'll get this poem. It's a short little poem, early. It didn't go in, some of the poems didn't go into the selected poems, you know. Um, Vermont Ashling. Vermont was like a war, whose attraction you shut out, preoccupied with a lifelong crush. But lately, you've been taken with this place, especially since Snow covers any resemblance to that other one and its perpetual row, stilled beneath the snow's silence. May it snow forever and forever now. That was a very early poem. It's not bad, actually. <laughs> I mean, it, I wouldn't overdo it. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I love all the poems here, but most of them. Are, like the last one I haven't read for years, so I don't know what it sounds to you like, but um, to be the poem on the page and the poem when it's uh, articulate uh, comes from the mouth of the person, especially who wrote them, I hear things in it that you mightn't hear, and I say, well, you might hear how bad it is, and I probably would think it's brilliant, but um, but you understand me, if it doesn't work, I'll get it, you know what I mean? Straight away. So we'll try this, so we? Um, The Professor of Forgetting. And maybe I should leave it with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right? The Professor of Forgetting. Again, I don't know, is this any good? All right? So you have to excuse me. Because all the other poems were brilliant. My mother, I can see her saying, oh, Gregory, oh, Gregory. <laughs> Sometimes, though, you, after a while, you, I, I don't, before I used to think a performance was a performance, but now I don't really much care. It's just you and me talking together and you're listening to me. Sometimes when you give a, a reading to a lot of people, like 500 or 1,000, which has happened a few times, um, it, it's a different type of reading. You know, it's like reading to one person, whereas no, this is intimate, you know what I mean? I hope I haven't bored you too much. If there was, I once turned up to a reading and there was nobody there, now that was even better. <laughs> um, I was just brought to dinner. Um, there's nothing worse than, this is good, there's nothing worse than uh, coming to reading and there's two people turn up and say, oh Jesus. <laughs> this is good. The Professor of Forgetting. An acquaintance asked why I call everyone darling, love, or kid. A query that I think came with an edge of cynicism, saying, stop being so corny. But By the way, I'm going to start this again, but I do this now. I call everybody dear, love, or whatever. Everybody. A kid... Old men, young, the, I'm giving away the poem now, but anyway, I'll start to get it if you don't mind. The professor of forgetting. An acquaintance asked, oh, this, sorry, I should say this is two pages. You're going to have to hang in there. You may have forgotten the start of the poem. Maybe that's the reason why. It's the longest poem I'll read. An acquaintance, and I, I love this, and thank you for coming. Thank you, loves. An acquaintance 
asked why I call everyone darling, love or kid. A query that I think came with an edge of cynicism, saying, stop being so corny. I said nothing, let it go. I am learning to let so much go. I didn't say how my memory is going, how after 40 years of teaching, a city of names has been filed away in the inaccessible vaults of the hippocampus. <laughs> how I can barely manage to retrieve this term's roster before the majority go the way students go, out into their unknown lives, wishing them the best with something like love in my tone. A few here, I think, for I have thought them about tone and words. How many classes have I said the like, repeated myself, repeating my repeatings, forgetting I'm repeating? Life is so much repetition, so much forgetting. Being is so much remembering now. I know most will forget our magic of poetry class, except maybe the students I gave a B minus or worse to. <laughs> How we hold on to the bad so much tighter, as if the deflated grade is an inflated life jacket. We grasp after the ship has sunk, except we float mostly in shallow water and all we have to do is put our feet down and walk to shore. <laughs> My mind drifts so easily. I have forgotten. My memory would be lucky to get a C minus. How I call even strangers Darling, love, kid, how I think I use kid the most, even to retired folks who are usually chuffed, perked up by my address, not like the student who scowled hard at me for the K word. <laughs> how hard it is to be in the world. How I think I say kid because of the way my father welcomed me home after school half a life ago. He'd unfold himself from over the flowers he planted in our middle-class garden that he'd retired to after his eight-to-five job in eagle printing, sorting sorts, setting characters, justifying, distributing. Straightening up, he'd fix his spectacles, rub the red quotation marks, on either side of the bridge of his nose and smile and just say, here's the kid. <laughs> Never a mention of love. It was all in the tone. All between the spaces, the lead, the dingbats, the words for telling its slant. So unassuming, so not in your face, and that was before my mother's taken for granted, casual, hello, love. I've always been forgetful, haven't I, ma? Remember how I forgot, left the three tassel caps, who knows where, my first week in school. <laughs> Woolen hatines, you spent all summer knitting. Or that time it slipped my noggin, to deposit my first wage packet, all set to pay my way in life at last. And arriving home found I'd lost it. How could you forget? I hear you. My mind's ear remembers. Remember? You thought I was kidding. I am forgetting that other country, that other world. I am forgetting, forgetting. I remember this. My memory is an emigrant and I am the alien, the illegal immigrant lost in a foreign state of the present. Excuse me. Where was I now? Oh, my darlings, 
loves kids. <laughs> I had one, I, I, I will finish with this now, but it's better to go short. You know what I mean? Most poets go on too long. I, 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 I find poetry reading so boring generally. <laughs> Even my own. I have, I mean, I do. Do you understand me? Except there are a few great, I mean, people like Billy, Billy, who's a friend, close friend, I mean, he does a fantastic job at a reading. I mean, he's very, very, Billy, he's very enjoyable. Do you know? But, oh, for Christ's sake, they should be shot. Oh, thanks, Billy. You torture. They've tortured so many poor. Did I torture you, darling? One more. Did I torture you? But I was given the job in the house because I had one brother and um, and my mother and father were kind of they couldn't see they were they could their eyes weren't great. My eyes were brilliant once upon a time. I but I, I was given the I was given the the job of treading the needle for my mother. Well, you know the way we all had little jobs in the house like and my mother would say tread the needle for me will you please. Um, there's a few words in this. I was not good at school. I had dyslexia, but nobody didn't know, knew what dyslexia was at then. Um, so I was just lazy, <laughs> which meant I was beaten once a week, once every two weeks for about 16 years, physically. It's not an exaggeration. I was in the lowest, there were four tiered classes. I, and I was in the bottom one, and I only got in because I was a very good swimmer, which kept my dignity. I swam on the Irish team, but it gave me dignity. I would have been crushed otherwise. Why and once a week? Once every two, well, I mean, this is an estimate. Once every two weeks, it's just the, 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 the stick or the, the leather or the cane came out a few times a day at least. Mm. Somebody got it, do you know what I mean? It was another world. I mean, there was great things about it too, though, you know? I mean... Were these nuns or brothers? Both. <laughs> and priests. And lay teachers. The whole system, everybody was doing it. But I had some great brothers too, you know. You see, I, I'm not actually, I'm not gone and knocking the clergy. I'm a non believer myself. Do you understand me? But I find that a little bit too easy as well, you know. I, but there were some terrible things done, man, of course. Um, but, but when I was a little boy, darling, what's your name? Finn. Finn? Finn! Spell it. F I N N. Fiona McCool. <laughs> Bit logic. Very good, love. When it, but we, the clergy were all powerful, more powerful than the government. The, the, the clergy was the government in Ireland. It would be no, it was like an extraordinary world. You couldn't say anything against it. You had to go with it, like, or else you'd be destroyed completely. Anyway. Neither here nor there. I'm a don is a dunce or a fool or a stupid person. Dread school, you get that. Um, there you are. By the way, I don't like making a myth of how stupid I was in school and how badly I was treated because I was slow in the ways that they taught of in that time, you know what I mean? But I don't like... People say, why don't you write? You should write about it. Because no, like the poems come up in exams in the Leaving Cert in Ireland. Like there's a great, teachers must swiveling in their graves. <laughs> How did many he manage that? You know? <laughs> and it is a kind of extraordinary that I managed to do what I did. And like, let us just say that there were no expectations <laughs> at all. He might be lucky to get a job in an office, low-level office, you know what I mean, or something. Which my mother would have liked, instead of by telling her I was going to be a great poet when I was 17. <laughs> anyway, to my mother, Eileen. Uh, and thank you, thank you for asking. My mother is delighted. Now, she's up there preening herself now, <laughs> saying, great, great. And actually, there's a funny story about this poem. I talk about the rotten teeth in it. Well, actually, it's popcorn. And she said privately to my, my brother, What's he saying about our rotten teeth? <laughs> no. I'm, to my mother Eileen, I'm treading the eye of the needle for you again. 
That is my specially appointed task, my gift that you gave me. Ma, watch me slip this camel of words through. Yes, rich we are still, even if your needlework has long since gone with the... I'm going to stop. I've got to tell you this. The rag and bone man is not made up. The rag and bone man came to our neighbourhood. The, the, the bones had gone at that point, but the, the rag and bone man would come and collect the rags, the clothes, torn up clothes, and they would use them and sell them. Um, uh, make paper? I don't know what they did with them. And, um, and also the bones would have been made glue and so forth, you know. Um, and he would come around, he'd have little toys, for, and then you'd run in and pester your mother for something. As I remember coming with a horse and cart. There were horses and carts in Cork City <laughs> in 1963. 64, 65, 66, 67, 68. I saw in my first year lifeguarding in the Kerry Beach in Inch Beach, if you ever saw Ryan's Daughters, the Long Street, they were ploughing the fields with horses in 19, late 1970s. It was just another... What happened then, the speed up was extraordinary. Anyway, sorry. There we go. Like you see, give me one more of them and you'll never get out of here. <laughs> All right, this is it now. To my mother, Eileen. I'm threading the eye of the needle for you again. That is my specially appointed task, my gift that you gave me. Ma... Watch me slip this camel of words through. Yes, rich we are still, even if your needlework has long since gone with the rag and bone man. And Da never came home one day. Or Dan, work, 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 lose yourself in work. That's what he'd say. Okay, okay. Ma, listen. I can hear the sticks of our fire spit like corn turning into popcorn with the brown insides of rotten teeth. We sit in our old sleeve-mish house. Norman is just born. He's in the pen. I raise the needle to the light and lick the thread to stiffen the limp words. I peer through the eye, focus, Put everything out of my head. I shut my right eye and thread. I'm important now, a likely lad, instead of the Amadon at dread school. I have the eye, haven't I the knack? I'm Prince Threader. <laughs> I missed it that try. Concentrate, concentrate, enough yakety yak. There. There, ma, look, here's the threaded needle back. <laughs> We're good. It's a pombo poetry. Yeah.